We're glad that you're with us today. We have an exciting broadcast with Dr. Neil Nedley. He's the president of Weimar Institute, the author of a number of books, including Proof Positive and Depression, A Way Out. Dr. Nedley, what a privilege it is to have you with us today. Oh, it's great being with you here. Good. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit today about depression, maybe because I've suffered from depression, even in my own experience. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't seem right that a Christian should ever be depressed. Uh, but there is a way to get over depression. Uh, depression, is it something that's guaranteed for everybody? Uh, no, if you don't have enough reasons to have depression, you won't experience depression. But every brain is prone to it if there are enough um, causes on board to uh, produce depression. Uh, you know, I was actually, there was another television host that was interviewing me a few years ago, and he said, you know, I seem to be resistant to depression. I've never had it my whole life. And I told him that even, even his brain could have depression, and two weeks later, he called me and he says, you know, I never should have said that. I've got severe depression now. Mm -hmm. And he had had a life experience that added on to other things. And now he had major depression. And he was much more interested in, in asking me real questions having to do with him now instead of just the TV audience. I guess so. I guess so. There are a number of things that play into it, what we call hits, factors that play yes. into depression. Yeah. Uh, the one that people will gravitate to most is... Well, I can't help it. It's, it's my genetics. Well, gene there are genetic bases for um, depression. There are biochemical changes that can take place as a result of depression plus lifestyle measures. It's never genetics by itself, although it will be with the cultural, American cultural uh, issues. Um, if you have bad genetics and you follow the culture, it kind of leads to depression, okay. attention deficit, anxiety. Those type of things are almost culturally induced uh, with what's happened in our society over the last um, several generations, and it's getting worse. Uh, but genetics loads the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. But the good news about genetics is we can actually deactivate those bad genes. First, we have to understand what those bad genes are. So by the time someone comes to one of our programs, um, you know, they're normally severely depressed and they've normally tried some other things before they come to our program. They may have tried medication, they may have tried all sorts of things, counseling, and, uh, and so they're at our program. And uh, we will actually find out precisely what is going on in their brain biochemically. And that's also genetically, and to see whether that gene is active or not. And there's a number of um, common genetic conditions that we'll see in our program. Probably the, one of the most common is what we call undermethylation. This is someone who has a calm exterior but a tense interior. And these are ones that seem to be uh, driven. If they're in school, they have to get an A. If they're in sports, they have to win. Uh, and uh, these are people that are also more prone to addictive tendencies, um, tend to have more of a high libido and can get into trouble that way as well. Uh, and uh, interestingly, once we find that undermethylation um, gene and the fact it's active, we can actually, through dietary and supplements, completely turn off that gene. So they'll still be successful in life, but now they won't have those uh, biochemical issues that are causing them uh, to have this very tense interior and tend to be driven towards obsessions and d driven towards actually um, social relationship problems uh, that an undermethylator uh, tends to have, particularly even with non-family members. And so, uh, uh, these are things that we can discover and, um, and actually do something dramatic so that they actually don't need medicine. And it'll work far better than medication when we use a combined approach. Because medicines often have side effects. Correct. And doing it naturally only has benefits. 
Yes, and one of the things, too, that we should understand is these medicines, often when they are given, the doctor will say, well, this is for your serotonin. We think your serotonin levels are low. And, uh, you know, serotonin is helpful to, for people with that tense interior. It's helpful for frontal lobe function. But those medicines are not actually helping us to make more serotonin. There's no serotonin in the medicine. It wouldn't help even if there was because it wouldn't actually get into the brain in the right synaptic areas. Uh, and, it's, and it's not increasing serotonin receptors. So how is it helping your serotonin level? It's actually blocking the reuptake of serotonin once it's released from the neuron. And this is what a lot of people don't understand. They're actually plugging the vacuum cleaners in your own neurons. Mm. And so it's able to release serotonin, but since it can't vacuum back, back up once the serotonin activity occurs, our brains are designed to be very efficient. And so once serotonin activity occurs, we release the serotonin and those vacuum cleaners pick it back up again so we can save that serotonin for further usage. But if we are low in serotonin, plugging those vacuum cleaners allows the serotonin to be around longer, so if we're in short supply, maybe we'll get some serotonin activity. But mm -hmm. then we end up by not reuptaking serotonin within six months to a year, we deplete the neuron of the very substance that we're trying to treat it with. Oh my. And this is why the person needs higher doses now and they're relapsing and now they're needing other medications and by the time they get to us often they're on four different medicines and sometimes more uh, because these medicines being primarily vacuum cleaner pluggers you know there's a serotonin uh, we call them selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that's the pharmaceutical name for a plugging a vacuum cleaner mm. uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors those are vacuum cleaner pluggers so these Antidepressants, the most commonly used ones, are actually just getting into our vacuum cleaners to plug them up. Hmm. And our program that we utilize is going to actually help them make more serotonin. It's going to actually pick up more serotonin receptors. But those are things having to do with nutrition and lifestyle measures. And that's why they'll work far more effectively. And long term. And long term and not produce the, 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 set, the, the setup for greater relapse and greater problems. We're creating far, basically psychiatric cripples that are dependent on multiple visits uh, to doctors for adjustments all the time because of the side, side effects that mm. a lot of people don't realize that are actually tending them to the same direction in which they were originally being treated for. Uh, Genetics, is genetics also a thing where, for example, I came home one day, I told my mom, Mom, I'm just angry. I don't know why. I'm on the outside, I'm fine. Inside, I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And I said, I got a wife who loves me. I got three kids, good kids. I, I got a job. So she goes off to a meeting that night. She comes back that night and she says, well, <clears throat> at least I know why you're angry. Which is a loaded statement and I kept my mouth shut. And then she said, uh, when you were conceived, I didn't want you. Wow. Now, is that a genetic thing where you're ab absorbing the, the negativity from your mother in utero? Is that genetics or is genetics something else? Well, that's what we would call epigenetics. Um, there are some things, uh, you know, your genetics are already determined by that point. Okay. Uh, but there are certain things that can activate those genes or not activate them. So it could have a significant bearing uh, on your mental health in the future. Uh, and so, yeah, she might have been touching on that, and that's a whole other area that we call adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And adverse childhood experiences um, today are at an all-time high. So, so, for example, I've heard it said that uh, nuclear families are now, um, have been marginalized. They're, that's abnormal to have a nuclear, one mom, one dad, 18 years. How many kids are a part of a family that has one dad, one mom, it's always been that way when they're 18 years old? Uh, it's actually 20% uh, of kids that are raised in a nuclear family where you have the biological dad, the biological mom, 
in a healthy environment uh, for them being raised during those 18 years and being raised by both of them at the same time in the same household. In a loving environment. Yeah. That's right. So that creates, as far as I'm concerned, just statistically, that creates all kinds of problems. Uh, the book, I Know Why a Caged Bird Sings, a, f uh, a famous book that all literature, English majors are supposed to read, is just that kind of a story. Mom and dad are divorced. Mom has a new boyfriend. Boyfriend rapes the little girl. These are childhood experiences, and I think there's more and far more of them now than there have ever been. Absolutely. Yes, even uh, sexual abuse is at an all-time high. Uh, one in four chance that a boy or a girl is going to be sexually abused before they're age 18. Mm. And uh, these are traumatic experiences. It'll produce scars on the brain, and it'll produce some, some significant issues. And so, yes, and we have, as a result, we have attachment disorders now at an all-time high. Mm. You know, it used to be what we're actually designed uh, to bond with our children. And there are things biochemically that are actually changing in the brain to help us bond with our children when they're born. Uh, and this is healthy. It's actually healthy for the parents and it's healthy for the child uh, to have these healthy attachments. Mm -hmm. uh, but as a result of adverse childhood experiences and all of the difficulties that mom or dad might be having, uh, attachment disorders are at an all-time high. And so there's a lot of unhealthy attachments that occur, and instead of attaching to human beings, they end up often today in today's society attaching to devices. Uh, and uh, this creates a very unhealthy relationship when our number one attachment is to devices and not actually to a human being. Mm. Uh, and fortunately, there are things that we can do about it, but it's quite a process. I mean, it requires them to come to a program like ours, it's going to be a comprehensive process where we actually take the device away from them, get to the core of the attachment disorder and be able to help counsel them in a direction that will actually help to turn off the bad effects of their childhood. And uh, there's mental filters that develop as a result of these attachment disorders. There's emotional reasoning. Uh, there's all sorts of cognitive distortions that become commonplace in those with attachment disorders. And so our counselors are experts in being able to help them undergo mental exercises to be able to think rationally and to be able to even bond healthfully in regards to relationships. And even themselves, if you have a, someone that you're dating with an attachment disorder, uh, it's going to be an issue. Uh, in regards to even marriage life and even how they're raising their own children. So it's very important for them to be able to solve that uh, earlier rather than later in life. Otherwise you're bringing a, a, tr a truckload of trouble to the marriage. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's encouraging that, that some of this stuff can be taken care of. Um, another thing that causes depression, I think, is the crazy life we live. I, ha I lived in Pennsylvania, so many of my neighbors were Amish. Mm -hmm. And years ago, back when Edison was first coming up with the electric light bulb, yeah. all the elders got together and they said, you know what, that's, that's heading us in a place we don't want to go. That's making you stay up late at night. We're not going to have electricity in our home. That's, that's of the devil. That's not right. That's not good. The reality is, is while it may seem a little prudish, there's a lot of truth to what they were worried about <laughs> uh, because we... We stay up all hours now. Right. So how does that affect the circadian rhythms and, and the daylight and night? How does that affect our depression? It affects it actually pretty powerfully. We actually have body clocks and we have something that sets our body clock. These are our daily cycles. It's actually the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. And that clock is actually set through light. Hmm. And so when we are exposed to light um, late at night, we're actually delaying our circadian rhythm. And this is why we feel like a zombie in the morning. And this is why we have trouble being able to get up and function. And then we have to start utilizing drugs like caffeine and things like that to be able to function in the daytime. Uh, but in reality, if we would go to bed earlier, get more melatonin at night, and get up at the same time every morning and be exposed to light, 
How we do it in the winter time up in the northern latitudes is actually utilizing a light box or some light um, eyewear. Uh, actually, uh, we, we utilize in our program um, an actual light glasses where it actually simulates the blue sky at 6 a.m. You can walk around and do things with this, but that 30 minutes of exposure after seven days, we can turn any nighttime person into a morning time person. Wow. And they'll actually make more serotonin in the daytime. They'll make more melatonin at night. Um, they're going to sleep far better instead of needing sleep aids and all of these false ways of trying to sleep. Once your body clock is reset, um, you can sleep a lot better. That's good. Now, you mentioned as part of this that we, we like run to coffee in the morning. Ah, I got to have my morning Joe before I can get going. And, and it seems to me like addictions today actually are, are not helping depression, but actually making more depression. Uh, coffee, whatever, how is this helping our, our depression? Well, it is hurting it. You know, it, these things are short-term gains and long-term problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, our world is fascinated with things that have both benefits and risks. And so they jump on board readily to caffeine. They jump on board readily to alcohol. They jump on board readily to marijuana. And all of these things that, uh, you know, have some short-term benefits but long-term risks. And uh, all of these things actually are frontal lobe suppressants. They suppress it in a little different ways and some more subtly and some more dramatically. Uh, but the drug society that we live in, from meth to, you know, amphetamines to cocaine, uh, to heroin, to the opioid crisis that we're suffering from, which is these frontal lobe suppressants, it has produced um, major problems, and it's actually um, decreased longevity in America. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that longevity is going down, and it's the first time since World War I that longevity has steadily declined the last three years. Hmm. We're about ready to come out with the fourth year statistics, and it looks like it's even gonna go down further in the uh, fourth year, although the CDC hasn't released that yet. And it's not because heart disease is going up. It's not because cancer rates are going up. It's not because of these chronic diseases. It's due to what we call deaths of despair. Hmm. And so alcohol-related deaths at an all-time high, over 100,000 people die every year as a direct result of alcohol. Hmm. Uh, and uh, we have opioid crisis, you know, where we have, um, you know, hundreds of people dying every day in this country from opioids. And of course, that's the addictive element. And then we have the non-substance addictions, when you add on to that, that are tremendous. We have the pornographic addictions that are so uh, prevalent and so gripping. We have technology addictions, uh, the YouTube and social media addictions and and uh, so, and all of these things actually do suppress the frontal lobe of the brain. And so we talk about freedom in our program. You are not a free person unless you are not addicted to anything. Hmm. And, uh, and once you become free and that frontal lobe wakes up, what a difference it makes in your life in regards to not only joy and happiness, but fulfillment and motivation. And, uh, but often people are self-medicating because of genetics, because of attachment issues, adverse childhood experiences, those things they are going short term for self-medicating, which sets them up for a long-term problem and poor decision making and all of those results come in. And that's why we need, they need a program. When, when you're talking about the frontal lobe suppression, to me, this is, this is absolutely critical because that's self-control. That's that's when you're thinking rationally. That's when you're, you're being mature. Right. And, uh, and as a pastor, I've seen so much immaturity. And some of the most strangest is, is when I've actually seen people self-mutilating. Uh, I've told some people before, I said, in the old days, they didn't have a problem with this because they had tigers that would eat you, mountain lions and bears <laughs> that would chase you. You didn't have to do that to find out if life is real or not. Uh, but we've insulated ourselves behind our little four walls and then our addictions and then our media that we're starting to wonder if anything's real anymore. Does, does mutilation and other things like that uh, act on our depression? 
Well, absolutely it does. And it's actually a form of self-medicating. All of these things are a form of self-medicating. Now you may wonder, how is a self-mutilator, how is that feeling good? Well, what happens is their emotions are so much in distress that in order to take away the pain of their emotions, they want to distract themselves. Mm. And so they produce severe pain with a deep cut in the arm and watch the blood flow. And so they actually feel a sense of relief because it's taking their mind off of their emotional pain onto this physical pain. And then they ended up quotes feeling better and now it's set up for an addiction. And so they end up with all of these scars as a way of trying to deviate their minds from the emotional pain. But the emotional pain is induced due to the fact that they're not able to manage their emotions uh, healthfully. Often th this cutting takes place you know, behind you know, four walls where they're in front of a screen uh, and they're on the internet and they're maybe on social media and posted a picture of themselves and got some dislikes and some bad comments and they don't know how to relate to that in regards to the poor emotional uh, response that they get from that. And uh, mm. so uh, it, we have seen an explosion of self-mutilation uh, since the internet came out and particularly when smartphones came out. And so there's quite a link there. And, but fortunately, anyone who's a self-mutilator, that can stop when we deal with the underlying issues that's causing the emotional pain. And so we have to you know, lay the ax at the root of the tree and find out all of the things that are causing that and what a difference. They'll go away and they'll never want to self-mutilate again. In fact, they'll, you know, months later. They'll see it for what it really is. Yeah, they'll see it for what it really is and say, I don't even know that person. A form of mutilation, although they would be offended if I say it on television, which I'm about to do, <laughs> is tattoos. Uh, I was talking to one person and they said, you know, I just wanted to know if I could see, get to that pain. And I thought, that's why you went to get a tattoo? Yeah. And, but again, it was the pain issue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a painful experience uh, going through that. Uh, and of course, there's other issues as well. This is the trying to be noticed. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people, um, you know, pride is at an all time high. And one of the symptoms of pride is craving attention, mm. uh, you know, trying to be noticed. Uh, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is part of that uh, aspect of things. But yeah, it is the pain as well uh, that will take their mind off their emotional pain. And sometimes, you know, what they'll do is load them, themselves up with alcohol to be able to even tolerate the pain when they go to the tattoo parlor and they're doing something permanent to themselves uh, and signing uh, this release under the influence of alcohol. It's just, it's, it's un, unimaginable that we actually allow this in America. You mm -hmm. can't undergo any permanent procedure in America if you have a frontal lobe suppressant on board, if you're having a medical procedure. And of course, these are non-medical people uh, performing this with a frontal lobe suppression as you're doing something permanent. And so there's a lot of regret afterwards as well. Uh, Something else to get depressed about. <laughs> exactly. So we, we've only got about a minute and a half left. There's a number of other things that cause depression. If you could give us the panacea, the one thing that we should be thinking about to say, I'm going to overcome depression, what would it be? It would be enhancing the front part of the brain and slowing down the limbic system in overdrive. That's the lower brain. Depression and anxiety are actually induced by the lower brain actually revving up and taking over the functions of the high brain, which is supposed to be the control center of our brain. And so the frontal lobe has to do with um, entertainment, uh, actually changing our entertainment to be frontal lobe enhancing. It has to do with things like music. It has to do with things like spiritual things and, and um, actually getting involved in what is true and rational in thinking, getting rid of the distorted thinking. So it has a lot to do with truth and spiritual things. And uh, those things can go a long way in starting to enhance the frontal lobe. And when we start changing some of our habits that are revving up our limbic system, uh, it can make a profound difference over time. Mm. We've been talking with Dr. Neil Nedley, president of Weimar Institute. 
And I hope that if you would like to learn more about overcoming your depression, that you'll check out uh, Weimar Institute's webpage, or you can call us here at Better Life Broadcasting. We'd be happy to pass that information on to you. Dr. Nedley, thank you. Thank you very much. Better Life Broadcasting is a viewer-supported Christian media ministry that offers streaming programming via apps on various devices. Please visit blbn.org to support Better Life or to get more information. And don't forget to like and subscribe.